a little okay. bit. Um, I don't want us to go so fast that we don't have enough time to hear important information from our, our witnesses. Um, with, so working from the bottom of the schedule up, we, the tax acceptances, they went to S55, will reschedule for tomorrow. And um, just looking at who is, who travels versus who's local. Okay. So, Jerry, uh, Mr. Duval, could you, uh, I don't know if you can, in 10 minutes, tee up your conversation, or you rather reschedule. I mean, I think the thing that we're trying to, we're taking on weatherization, and the, the <coughs> reason you're the lead-off witness is that there's a much larger context for the, for the weatherization con uh, conversation. And I thought that you could help us establish that context and then help us understand what weatherization goals might look like. We have 10 VSA 581, but we also have other things like the Paris Accord, 90 by 2050. Um, so is it a 10-minute window so ridiculously narrow that you can't work with it. I can, I can help set the context in 10 minutes, and if there's further, I'd be happy to come back. Great, perfect. I think what I want to make sure is people don't sort of dive into our current weatherization program and not see the reasons around it, nor that we even know about all the programs that are going to be Do you think we receive that in the mail? There's so, an electronic version. Yeah, I have so a copy. Anyone who would like to follow along with the paper copy, oh, I, have, paper. I have those as well. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. Glad to be with you. My name is Jared Duvall. I serve as the Executive Director of the Energy Action Network, which is a diverse network of nonprofits, businesses, uh, fuel dealers, utilities, low income advocacy groups, a, a very diverse uh, composition across Vermont that uh, works together to achieve Vermont's uh, energy and emissions reduction commitments. That broad network of over 200 members and state partners um, is supported by a small backbone nonprofit organization that works with state partners, uh, both who are in the room to track progress towards our total energy commitments as a state and our emissions reduction commitments. So um, what I was hoping to do today was just briefly review what those are and where we stand now in the role that weatherization plays in meeting them. Um, so if you look at page three of the presentation, um, you, you're all familiar, I believe, with the 2016 Comprehensive Energy Plan, which sets our long-term goal of 90% renewable by 2050. Uh, currently, uh, we, Vermont, stands as of the end of last year uh, at 19% renewable overall. And it's, it's important to uh, remember that that's a total energy figure, so including electricity, transportation, and thermal, and each of those sectors have different shares of renewability. When we get to the emissions reduction commitments, um, the, the, the fastest approaching is what Governor Scott committed to, which was keeping the U.S. in the U.S. Climate Alliance with the Paris Climate Accord, which would require a 26 to 28 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions below 2005 levels by 2028. Um, as of the most recent data from the Agency of Natural Resources uh, Emissions Inventory, we are just 2% below 2005 uh, greenhouse gas emissions levels. <coughs> um, you can see on page five, oftentimes we talk about these three sectors of our energy economy and energy use as though they're relatively similar, but they have very different profiles when it comes to the amount of energy used, the amount of emissions they produce, and the energy burden that they uh, put on Vermonters in terms of the bills we pay for energy. Um, I won't get in depth into that, but if you're interested in comparing transportation, thermal, and electricity by use, emissions, and energy burden, that is on page five. Um, so going directly to what you asked me to review, Chairman, about uh, the, em the different emissions goals and commitments that the state has, has set, there are many that we track. Um, 
if you see on page six, there is a, a green dot that says 7.46. That refers to million metric tons, and that's the level we would have to get to over the next six years to, to meet Vermont's or Governor Scott's uh, Paris uh, commitment. There are, of course, other goals that have been set. There are the statutory goals, uh, one of which had a 2012 deadline that has been passed, but there's the 50% reduction in emissions below 1990 levels by 2028, which you can see is the 4.3 dot on this. And then, of course, those the um, comprehensive energy plan and the statutory uh, goals end up lining up uh, more or less when you get out to 2050. But one of the things that we've found is that it's really difficult to um, look out that far into the future. And so we've tried to bring the horizon forward to 2025, the most recent commitments the state has made in terms of uh, the governor with the Paris Climate Commitment, and then also the first milestone of the Comprehensive Energy Plan is in 2025, 25% renewable. And so we have done uh, analysis based on, uh, I should say up front, that Energy Action Network, because we have such a diversity of members, we do not take uh, positions on specific uh, bills or policies. Uh, we remain uh, neutral and uh, we serve as a, as a neutral convener and an objective tracker working with state partners of, of the data. So we focus less on policy and more on what are the proven and available technologies and best practices for reducing emissions and for uh, keeping more of our energy dollars in state. Um, if you look at page 11, this is our analysis that we call the path to Paris. It is not prescriptive. It is not, I should not say the path to Paris. It is a path to Paris that um, helps show the scale of emissions reduction that would be required across our energy sectors to achieve it. Um, and you can see that the thermal sector uh, in the middle of that chart added together is the largest single opportunity for emissions reduction in Vermont. If in addition to weatherization, we also look at what is sometimes called fuel switching or moving off of fossil fuels and towards heat pump water heaters, heat pump, uh, cool climate heat pump systems for heating and uh, advanced wood heating systems, including both pellet boilers and efficient wood stoves. So um, I want to focus on the role that weatherization plays among those top drivers. Um, so it was mentioned um, that, I make sure I cite this correctly. Um, so if you, I'll, I'll share copies of this at the end of the presentation. But this is EAN's 2018 annual report. And on page 28, there is a listing of all of the administrative and statutory targets related to energy that we've been able to find and track. Um, and 10 BSA 578 uh, is the emissions reduction uh, target that I referenced earlier. And then on the thermal side, uh, 10 BSA 581 set the goal of improving the energy fitness of at least 20% um, of the state's housing stock by 2017, which is passed, and 25% by 2020. Based on reporting from the Public Service Department, we stand at about 25,400. Um, uh, housing homes uh, weatherized to meet that goal in the next two years would require an additional 55,000 homes weatherized. The next two years, did you say? By 2020. 2020, thank you. Um, and that, re that data is, I think, reported a year behind. So that, that late at 25,400, I believe, is through 2017. Um, but the current pace has been about 2,000 a year. So we are orders of magnitude away from what it would take to meet the state's uh, commitments. If you look at what it would take to meet this path to Paris modeling, which you can see that the weatherization is just one component, um, but you can see on page 14, we modeled that you would need an additional 90,000 homes weatherized over the next six years. Um, and our, our modeling shows a slow and ste a steady ramping up of that, going from basically a tripling of where we are now in the 2,000 or so homes per year to about 6,000 in the next year, uh, just under 8,000 after that, but um, continually increasing 
year after year to meet these targets. Um, the last thing I want to say um, before uh, concluding is that this is not just about helping meet emissions reduction and renewable energy commitments. This is a massive economic development opportunity. 70 to 80 cents of every dollar that we spend on fossil fuel, which is 100% imported in Vermont, leaves the state. Um, and it doesn't just leave the state for other states or for the broader region. Oftentimes, it leaves the state through multinational fossil fuel companies where those profits are going to places like Russia or Saudi Arabia or Venezuela or pick your foreign oil export. In contrast, all of the efficient and renewable energy solutions that we model keep far more of Vermonters' energy dollars here in state, uh, recirculating, supporting our neighbors, helping create local jobs, and helping folks save money in the long term. There are um, charts here, for instance, that show the relative costs of different ways to heat your home. If you look at chart, uh, the, page, the, the graph on page 18, it shows you the average heating fuel prices for the last 20 years. The two that are consistently the highest cost and the most volatile, putting the most strain on family budgets, are in purple, the propane, and in blue, the fuel oil. In contrast, the um, efficient and renewable options of advanced wood heat, whether that's chips or pellets uh, or cordwood and EPA certified stoves, or whether it's cold climate heat pumps, are all much more stable costs and lower for Vermonters over time. And you know what that transition is in terms of investing in weatherization versus fuel switching, there are different percentages of dollars that stay in state or not. But it's generally two to three to four times more of our dollars staying local and helping grow Vermont's economy um, when we make those investments. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for concise big picture. What's been going on with the uh, What's been going on? As what has been going on? That's my question. Well, we actually, Mr. Wilcox will be showing us a chart with how many homes are done under which programs. I believe. You told us what we already know. So why aren't you pounding the table? Saying uh, we're scheduling if for not, that next if week. not us. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> That's an, an important conversation to have, and we have uh, there are people who can speak better to that in the room and beyond the room. Uh, if anyone with, does not have a hard copy of the full 2018 annual report from EAN, I'm happy to. <coughs> I, well, I got one at home, but I have a second one here. Thanks. Very nice. Yesterday. Thank you very much. Um, uh, can we do a little switch up here and, and ask uh, Mr. Wilcox to jump in and well, actually no, let's stick with the batting order. Uh, Mr. McNamara. Sure, it can be two minutes. <coughs> There's a lot of professionals coming to the table. We're in the speed drill phase of the session. Yep. Uh, good morning, my name is Ed McNamara. I'm planning director for the Department of Public Service. And I'm just going to quickly touch on the 2019 Annual Energy Report. We submitted this January 15th uh, of this year. It's a new requirement, uh, part of the Comprehensive Energy Planning uh, Statute, basically asking us to report on where we're, where we're at and what we should do moving forward. <coughs> Jared did a great job explaining um, the background where we are and how short we are in meeting the uh, 581 goals. Uh, so I'm not going to go through that. The Climate Action Commission, I understand that Paul Costello will be here tomorrow to talk about the Climate Action Commission recommendations. Um, so really the annual energy report that we submitted only touched on a couple tweaks around the edges in terms of weatherization, mostly to do with uh, efficiency Vermont. One recommendation was to consider using the energy efficiency charge associated with heat pumps and taking that instead of having that energy efficiency charge used for reducing kilowatt hours, switch that money so that it's used for um, weatherization. And then another 
um, aspect that we recommended as well was Efficiency Vermont uses weatherization eligible funds <clears throat> for heat pumps and we've recommended that those el weatherization eligible funds be used just for weatherization. Other entities focus on heat pumps. And as I'm saying that, I'm recognizing I should back up a little bit. <clears throat> Funding sources for Efficiency Vermont. Energy efficiency charge raises money for um, kilowatt hour reduction, something on everybody's bill. For weatherization related activities and any thermal activities, that money comes from two different sources. Um, regional greenhouse gas initiative and the forward capacity market. So that's money that's outside of the state's control. Regional greenhouse gas initiative, however many allowances get sold and what the costs are, that's going to be what we get for Reggie money. Forward capacity market, again, that's run by ISO New England. We have very limited control over what the outcome is. <clears throat> so this is a funding source that Efficiency Vermont, the PUC, the department, nobody has control over, and that amount um, sort of rises and falls depending on those revenue sources. We're actually likely to see a reduction in those funding sources, primarily because forward capacity market the clearing price was reduced significantly from where it had been previously. Good for electric rate payers, not so good for funding for weatherization. So overall, the department uh, recognizes that Climate Action Commission has made some recommendations regarding how to potential pathways to significantly increase weatherization efforts. I'm not here to talk about that. Paul Costello can talk about it. And if you would like an administration viewpoint on that, Peter Walk from um, ANR is the best person for that. I think following up on the, perhaps Senator McDonald's question, uh, I'm wondering if you could tee this up a little bit more for us. I think people sat down, we're talking about weatherization, we're not really responding to anything. I think we just need some context for sure. some of this that we're hearing today before we kind of move forward a little bit if that's helpful um, to thank you so <clears throat> there there's a bill right. that's going to be turned in today mm -hmm. as in draft form um, if you uh, that basically says let's pick up the pace on weatherization mm -hmm. uh, increase the funding <clears throat> uh, response to uh, the department's report the, the climate action committee report the, advocates so that bill will formally be we'll have it as a drafting request we can work through for the balance of the week um, and um, the goal is to um, so today for example we're asking folks not to come in to respond to the, the, the bill so no, it's fine right. thank you so yeah before we started to look at the details of any particular bill um, for instance, one of the things that always draws attention is how are you going to raise more money? And before we get uh, stuck on that, I wanted us to be able to back up enough to say, well, actually, there's there are five different actors all delivering uh, weatherization services in the state, by, and who are they, and what are they doing, and where's the money coming from? And then how does the, you know, in the department's report, there's levels of nuance that McNamara is talking about now in terms of I said New England for capacity dollars flowing in and so if we're we have really two um, different sorts of programs going out there still the programs that focus on low income weatherization they're in title 33 but then throughout title 30 our energy uh, statute we have we keep on referring to doing uh, weatherization and thermal load work and um, so we need frankly money for both and before we start getting pulled into details on just one program or the other I thought it'd be good for us to look at the big picture and then imagine how we would do both lower income with more low income weatherization as well as uh, moderate income weatherization since it's a, a win for anyone who does weatherization work so thank you for the question sorry I just wanted to give you a very quick overview of what the department had recommended. Sounds like we're in much more nuance than where you folks are at the moment. So, um, so I think we'll be circling back to that. I think. So the goal, 
up on the corner it left up for a right corner of the page, uh, 24, 24 community days left. That is my estimate based on my normal adjournment. <coughs> so we'll be working along a good clip, not too fast, but not too slow. And just for a first, we'll get the big picture straight. And then I think we need to tune in with those <coughs> adjustments that you uh, laid out in your report, which was very helpful. <clears throat> also suggest talking to uh, the folks from Efficiency Vermont and Vermont Gas as well. Yeah. So they're on our schedule for later this week. Great. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mack. Thanks. Okay. So I wonder, I mean, for me personally, it would yeah. be helpful, and I know I signed on to the bill, maybe by tomorrow we just have it in front of us, perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, just so we can start asking questions, and, um, if that makes sense. We will be able to have that request, I think, by Thank tomorrow you. morning. Okay, so thank you. Um, Mr. Wilcox, good morning. Hello. We've got handouts here. Thanks for coming in again. Paper clip. Sure. Thank you. So you know we're under squeeze play, but I think yes. you can lay out the weather data system program. Can you manage that? That would be helpful. Sure, so I can do the 10-minute 10, 10 explanation of what our program does. Uh, who we serve. So I, my name is Jeff Wilcox. I work for the Office of Economic Opportunity in Waterbury at the state office. We're part of the Agency of Human Services and the Department for Children and Families. I've worked in weatherization 21 years, the, the last 10 at the state office, the previous 11 at uh, the Community Action Agency in Barrie in the weather, local weatherization program. So, uh, so my handout is on top that I'm going to kind of work through. Uh, so our, our program uh, creates safer, healthier, and more efficient homes. We're an anti-poverty program that, that puts money back in clients' pockets by saving energy for them on their heating and electric bills. Uh, I work for the, like I said, the Agency of Human Services and the Office of Economic Opportunity. You may ask, we're not an energy office, why is it? Why is the program located <coughs> here? Well, it's because we do a lot more than just energy savings. We provide a lot of benefits for clients through saving energy. Uh, and we've had the program for 40 years. Uh, and uh, we've, there's three full-time staff at our office, myself included, that uh, our jo job is to provide guidance for the, the agencies, training, quality control, quality assurance. Uh, and we, we do that with uh, three folks uh, in Waterbury. Uh, so our, who do we work with? We work with the five uh, local weatherization programs that are situated throughout the Vermont to, to serve the state. Uh, four of them are community action agencies who have a weatherization program within, and the other is NEDO, the Northeast Employment Training Organization, uh, who is not a, a CAP, they're a nonprofit. Uh, so each of those, you know, and I want to just state the obvious. So this program is, is no cost to low income clients. So the, I'll get to the funding in a bit, but we have about $9 million a year to provide the services for clients. They have no out of pocket expense. Uh, so with that said, our, our five sub grantees, we call them, or, or program providers, uh, they employ about 100 workers statewide. So each employ about 20 weatherization workers. They include energy auditors, crew workers, uh, office folks, as well as the, the director of each office. Uh, they em employ or sub-grant out to uh, heating contractors, plumbers, electricians. And we hire a you know, significant amount of uh, contractors throughout the state to, to fully serve our clients. Uh, who do we serve? Uh, Vermont homeowners and renters with household incomes 80% of median income or below. So for example, if, if you're a, a family of four, if your gross income is 63760 or below, you are eligible for the program. Uh, we do have a, a wait list statewide of approximately seven months if you averaged all five agencies. Uh, because of that, we've developed a, a mechanism to prioritize who we serve based on need. Uh, some of it comes from the Department of Energy requirements, uh, but a lot of it's state statute. So those uh, priority uh, priorities are clients who receive fuel assistance, 
uh, clients who are in the lower income bracket, you know, less than 60%, and actually, if you're less than 25%, you have an even higher priority. Families with elderly, disabled, families with children, and as well, high energy usage homes. Uh, so uh, I want to talk quickly about how, how the process works. So a, a client applies uh, for weatherization immediate to each five agencies. So they apply if they live in Barrie to Capstone Community Action. The, the Capstone Weatherization Program will deem if the clients are eligible or not. Uh, and if they're eligible, they will uh, send them a letter stating which, and then they will start the process with an efficiency coach visit, which efficiency coach goes out to the home, sits down with the client, talks to them about the weatherization process, what's gonna happen, coaches them on energy conservation, uh, looks around the home for any, any things that may you know, pro prohibit or make weatherization more difficult, like vermiculite, a wet basement, stuff like that, or significant structural repairs. But they also sit down with the client and do what uh, a one-touch screening and referral for other health and social programs, service programs. That's a, a process we created a few years ago to try to be as holistic and comprehensive as we can through our weatherization program. So we refer clients, if, if they're willing and, and need that referral, to the lead-based paint program, Head Start, Aging Services, Vermont Quit Hotline, believe it or not, and, some, uh, and many others. Uh, the next step is a separate visit by the energy auditor, and this is kind of critical to how we spend our money. The energy auditor goes out, does a lot of diagnostic testing, infrared cameras, blower door testing, tests all heating system and combustion appliances for safety and efficiency. So they, they're out there to, to, to test and gather information and to bring it back to the office and then you know, with their energy modeling program, determine what's gonna be the best return on investment, the big bang for our buck is a, a slogan we use in weatherization. We wanna spend our money most effectively improving the, any health and safety issues, but then getting a, re, a significant return on investment, a lot of energy savings for the dollars we put into the home. So that's the energy audit. Uh, the energy auditor determines that with uh, use of the ener state energy auditing tool, and then they write a work scope that uh, they then hand over to their, their uh, your manager who then sends out and gets heating systems cleaned and tuned or repaired. Uh, we do that first to make sure everything's operating safely before we then go into the home and uh, weatherize it, meaning we tighten up the home with uh, spray foam, caulking, weather stripping. Uh, we're very diligent and meticulous about tightening up the home and especially in certain places like the attic. We always want to start at the attic. So the air seal, which changes how the home works and how it integrates with heating systems and combustion appliances, and then they insulate. So uh, that's, that's kind of what the crew does. And then when the crew work is all done, the, uh, the agency sends out their quality control inspector who goes out and verifies all the work was done as it was specified to be done and installed to our statewide uh, technical procedures manual. So that's kind of the process. Then the agencies report those jobs to us monthly, as well as an invoice. Uh, at our office, we review that monthly, um, monthly <coughs> daily, and verify uh, the work was done to, to our standards. And one of the folks in our office goes out and does monitoring of the five agencies. So he inspects 10% of the completed work of each of the five agencies. Goes out, meets with the client, talks to them, asks them how things went, if they notice the difference tests uh, certain items like a blower door test to verify what the agencies have uh, sent us for information. Uh, and if, if they find something that wasn't done quite up to spec, uh, they'll have the agency go back out and fix it. Uh, and then, uh, so that's kind of the process of weatherization. We do that uh, 850 times a year. Well, we weatherize 850 homes a year. Oh. Uh, yep, and you asked if, uh, for a chart of what we've done for the, the last few years. I didn't prepare that, but the second handout on the bottom line shows the number of units we've weatherized for the last number of years. So I want to talk uh, about uh, who will weatherize or what homes. So we, we do weatherize single family and multi family <coughs> homes, so owner occupied and rental. The caveat is, you know, the home has to be 
lived in by an income eligible family. Uh, when it's owner occupied, like I said earlier, there's no cost to the, the client or the homeowner. If it's a rental, uh, all energy saving work is paid for by the weatherization program. All health and safety matters like uh, indoor air quality, bathroom fans, cleaning tubes to cleaning tombs to heating systems are paid for by the owner of the building if they aren't income eligible themselves. So our programs require the landlord to do that work before we set foot on the property to install insulation in the air ceiling. Uh, we do ins uh, invoke a, a rent stabilization agreement for rentals that, that requires the landlord, uh, the owner, to uh, make sure the rent doesn't go up uh, for an, either one or three years. One year if uh, one year if the uh, owner pays the heat or the client pays the heat. Three years if the owner of the building is paying the heat. Uh, so let's see here. So our funding comes from two different places essentially. Uh, the Department of Energy Weatherization Program created our program in the late 70s and there's a program in every state in the country that receives DOE, Department of Energy funds. We typically get 1.1 million to this year we have 1.4 million. Uh, and our state weatherization program has gone by different names over the years. It used to be called the Weatherization Trust Fund and now it's the Home Weatherization Assistance Fund which is created from a tax on the fuel, two cents per gallon, and the gross receipts on natural gas, electricity. So we typically, uh, 1.3 to 4 million from DOE, and then you know, seven, seven or so with our state program. And within that seven million, we do a, a lie heap swap in recent years. Uh, don't wanna get into that right now, I'm gonna keep moving here. Uh, so the big picture, uh, Just so you know, Mr. Face has agreed to come back tomorrow, so we'll, okay. you're, you're back you know, today. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, Richard. <laughs> uh, so the big picture, uh, things I want to convey is, is the cost, the net cost effectiveness of our program. You know, we're, we're all about testing and confirming, testing to determine what's going to be the, the measures that are going to be the best benefit for the client and the household and also what's going to have the best return on investment from energy savings. So, you know, a lot of folks think, oh, I need to replace my windows. Well, we've never replaced windows in weatherization unless they're broken and gone and it's done more for a health and safety. You know, so air sealing and insulating uh, poorly insulated surfaces and drafty surfaces is what gives us a much better return on investment and savings for the client. So it's all about testing and evaluating and then uh, setting your work scope uh, based off those, those results. Uh, our average savings per year, like 27%, the numbers are flashing through my eyes. I know it's, it's around there. And that's, that's not based on a fuel study because our clients typically you know, are using different sources of fuel and it's hard to, to do a fuel study in Vermont with bulk fuel delivery. So, so our modeling program, which is approved by the Department of Energy, uh, Estim we, we enter all our, our pre-data and then our post-data and it estimates savings uh, and that's where we get our, our, our savings. Uh, comprehensive, you know, I think I've beaten that one to death. We're, we're really comprehensive. When we go into a home, we change how the building works and if we aren't comprehensive and if we don't test, we can harm people, uh, cause backdrafting, uh, cause mold and mildew uh, from tightening up a home. So. So health and safety and testing is really critical to when you do this type of work. Uh, holistic, you know, the efficiency coaching and the, the one-touch referral, we're trying to benefit our clients as much as possible, not just by energy savings and money in their pocket, by uh, weatherization is proven to, to really improve the health of the home and the household and the clients make it comfortable. Uh, better air quality, and I, I think there's a, one of the attachments is a, a one, two-pager from the Department of Health uh, and they have a lot longer version of that that's very good. Then there's a, a national study uh, done by Oak Ridge National Laboratories that really talks about the non-energy benefits of weatherization and they're, believe it or not, they're more significant than the energy benefits of weatherization. Can you pause just for a moment? Sure. Again, because I think people hear it and then it's surprising enough that they don't necessarily take the yeah. saying that the investment that's made in the energy investment, uh, 
end up more than being compensated by the savings in health care? Yeah. Uh, not necessarily health care, but uh, we'd love to get that data to, to, to show the health care uh, profession. But, uh, and I, I, I'm not going to give you numbers because they're swirling in my head, but that study will show. Okay. Uh, but just by improving the, the, the indoor air quality and the safety, we go into homes that uh, the heating systems are spilling and backdrafting into homes, uh, you know, knob and tube wiring or wiring that's dangerous. We're improving the safety, the indoor air quality, uh, which results in less days sick for clients. Uh, you know, they miss school less. Uh, they're healthier when they go to school, they will learn better. You know, so it's hard to quantify exact savings uh, dollar-wise, but uh, there's some studies that do a pretty good job of it. And, and there's a larger study that I don't, we didn't include, but I can I mentioned to you, I can email that to you. So yes, it's some pretty good organizations that have crunched those numbers and, and shown that the non-energy benefits are significant. So challenges, I want to mention challenges to our program. So any given year, these are the challenges we face when we weatherize homes. Uh, we have one of the oldest housing stocks in, in, in the state and we're at the roughest housing, housing homes in the, in the state. You know, so we, we deal with leaking in pipe. The, in the country. Oh uh, yeah, I'm sorry, oldest housing yeah. stock in the country, but of the homes we're serving in Vermont, we're in the, we're the lower income folks who have deferred maintenance, so we're in the the roughest of the rough. Uh, so the challenges that we have to face are vermiculite insulation that has asbestos, wet basements, leaky roofs, rotted sills, knob and tube wiring which we can't insulate around, asbestos pipe wrap that's come frayed and is all over the place that we can't disturb, mold, hoarding, uh, leaky pipes. So our, our weatherization funds have some ability to address some of those things but we can't address all of them so we're all often trying to to leverage funding from other sources, help clients apply for low income, low interest loans, et cetera. Uh, we can't take care of all those things with our own funds. Uh, so in a lot of the homes we go out to have those issues. Uh, so that's something that important to remember with our low income folks. There, there are a lot of challenges. Let me that since you, you have to treat all of them sort of holistically, if they can't find funds for some of these other necessary repairs that you can go ahead yourself. Right. Yeah, I should explain a little better. So those issues prohibit our weatherization because we can't go and install measures that are going to get wet or get ruined, and we can't tighten up the home if there's a, a wet basement or rain, you know, getting the house damp, it'll just be a, create a lot of mold and mildew in an unsafe condition. So, so yes, uh, if, if we can't get the help for them, we'll have to defer the home until it is, is taken care of. We try, we're try. we working on processes to def defer as few as we can, but, but every year we do defer some homes at each agency. Who would be able to replace something like a roof <coughs> so that you could insulate that? Yep, uh, there's the USDA 504 loan program that's a grant or loan program depending on the age. Uh, there are some obstacles uh, depending on the size of the house and the, the size of the lot doesn't allow some clients to receive a loan or Those grant. Are for individual homes? Yes. Right? Okay. Yep. So people, families would apply? Yep, they'd apply. And if they're eligible, they could get a really low interest loan. Or if they're over 62 or 5, they could get a grant. Would you help them in that process? Yep, our, do we program? do help them. So you notify yeah. them that yep. this is a possibility? Yes, okay. definitely part of our process right. when we have to defer a job or before we have to defer a job, we're trying to link those clients to the other sources. There's right. the home ownership networks who have home repair funds. Uh, we have set aside a little bit of funding with each agency called the, the home, the HWAP home repair program uh, and the HWAP vermiculite funding so that we can, you know, kind of leverage those other sources to help clients so we don't have so many deferred homes. Yep. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, there's been a lot of people talking about increasing the amount of work, doubling, tripling, quadrupling, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I, I guess the concern probably everyone in the room shares is how quickly can we increase a program while not sort of overwhelming the capacity of those programs to receive new monies and spend them well. Do you have any thoughts about how we pick up the pace and what kind of capacity do you have to just to do more of the current personnel or do you have to hire more, train more people? Uh, we've, 
uh, Sarah, who's the, off, the director of the Office of Economic behind me, we produced kind of a, a plan because we've been asked these questions before. Uh, is that in the attachments, sir? Yeah. Okay. So in general, I would say, you know, weatherization, you've got to do it right to be effective and get the savings and the benefits for the clients, which requires on-the-job training as well as specific training. We can't just hire you know, a carpenter tradesman off the street except and expect them to know how to insulate attics and air seal up to our standards. So training is important. Uh, you know, so ramp up all depends on the workforce and the ability to train and uh, stuff like that. Okay. So thank, uh, again, I apologize to, to everyone in the room, especially our guests, that we are uh, short time. So I'd ask everyone to read the handouts we got Mr. Facey's rescheduled. If we have more questions, we'll, we'll uh, send them on. But thank you for helping us uh, and see you. how thank this you. program runs. I think for, mo for a lot of people, they think this is the only program in the state. When I hear people talk about home weatherization, they think it's only yeah, we're the folks and Capstone. And the we're the only low income so yeah. yeah, There is confusion. There's the five local providers. Capstone is one of them. Yeah. And we're the, the office that administers and runs the statewide program. Well, thank you for your work. I know sure. that when I've talked to people who've had your assistance, it's been a uh, profound change for them. Yeah, if I could mention one more thing, and I typically read a thank you note that, that's in your handout that uh, so explains good. the benefits to the clients. It's, it's pretty holistic and pretty amazing in a lot of cases. So if you can take two minutes to read that, sure. it's worth your time. Hey, the, the brief story I heard from a witness before was, they were visiting a capstone weatherized home, and uh, the woman who was who lived there said, um, it's so great to be able to sleep in my bedroom, which was right off the kitchen. And they, he said, well, why weren't you sleeping in your bedroom before? And she said, well, it was far too cold in there. She was had spent years sleeping on her kitchen floor mm -hmm. in front of the oven, with yep. the door open, and the oven running attempt to stay warm enough to make it through winter. So yeah. that's the kind of thing that's an eye opener. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen many stories like that. Yes, that's not a healthy occurrence. Uh, a lot of stuff like that. So thank you. Again. Sure. Thank, thank you. Much. So committee and interested parties will be taking this up and diving right back in tomorrow morning. Thank you all.